My name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director for the Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. And today is Tuesday, the 8th of March. And 2022. And we are located at RAC um, Mortgage Banker, located in uh, the city of Tampa, uh, state of Florida. Uh, sir, what is your name? Uh, Herbert Wilson. Okay, Mr. Wilson. And um, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, no, I don't mind at all. I'm 72 years old. Okay. What branch of the service are you in? United States Air Force. Okay, what year did you go into the Air Force? I went into the Air Force in 1967. What were you doing at that time, before you went into service? Before I went into the service, I was on a summer break from high school. Okay. That's where I was. And um, in the decision-making process, I was going to go to college or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, what high school was that? McKinley Tech High School in Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. Is, is that where you were born? Uh, yes, I was born in Washington, D.C., absolutely. Okay, fascinating. Um, why did you choose that branch of the service, the Air Force? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because my uh, stepfather at the time was active duty, uh, but he never talked to me about joining, you know, the military. And um, over the summer that I was on my school break, um, before college was supposed to start, uh, I did some research with the different recruiters and just found that the Air Force was more appealing than the other branches of the service at that time. Did, did you have conversation with any, any other recruiters about the other services? Yes, I did. I had conversation with the Marines, with the Army, with the Navy, and the Air Force. Okay. And why, why, did you, why did you choose the Air Force? What was better about the Air Force than the other branches of the service? That's kind of hard to say, and I think what kind of got me with the Air Force was the fact that they talked about the fact of furthering my education, because I knew at that point that I was not ready to go to college, but there was opportunities that they told me that were there that would allow me to pursue furthering my education later on in my career, at some point in my career. And did you pursue your college education while you were in the service? Yes, I did. What did what you major in? Uh, I was a kind of a political science type of person, uh, political science and social studies type of person. And what wound up happening is it kind of got diverted into a, a counseling arena some kind of way. You know, uh, it, it was interesting. It just kind of took different roads as my military career started to blossom, mm -hmm. the roads that I took as far as my education just kind of followed that road, you know, it kind of enhanced what I was doing in the military. Okay, so you you originally were interested in which major, but you wound up in counseling? Yes, I wound, I wound, I wound up in counseling, basically, is what I wound up in. I mean, I, I did the gamut. I, I did the sociology thing, I did the psychology thing, you know, all these things, the historical things, it just kind of bounced around, you know, is, is what it was. And then again, in the end, it wound up being more of a, a counseling aspect, uh, more, more than anything. Now, the, the military, the Air Force, again, directed you in your, into your career field as far as, you know, expounding your degree is what they did. They directed me into my communication career field, you know, and they, they insisted that, okay, at some point you're going to have to achieve a degree in communications technology, you know, and all the other things that you want to do will just kind of be added fluff. It's, okay. It's kind of how they looked at anything else that I did. Where did you go to basic training? I went to basic training uh, in September of 67, and I went to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Right, from how, six, eight weeks? How yeah, long? it was six to eight weeks uh -huh. because I left there in November, I believe it was, of 67 uh, uh, and went on uh, a few miles down the road to um, Wichita Falls to Shepherd Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Is that where you, um, your MOS? Yeah, uh -huh. my MOS, I was Communications Center Specialist and I spent 13 weeks in school there. 
Wichita Falls, um, um, working on you know um, getting proficient you know in, in the job skills. Okay, so from basic training to um, to your tech school, um, did your flight <laughs> um, or I, what was the name of the group in in, um, in tech school? Was it still a flight? Oh, uh, it was a. Let's see. I can tell you exactly what it was. <laughs> it was they called it a technical, technical, technical training school. Okay. This is what they called it. Were there any casualties? Any injuries? From through your initial training, basic and tech school, for me, it, you or anybody else in your group. Yeah, in, in basic training, there were a few guys that had sprained ankles. You right. Know, when we did the PT and things of that general nature, general. and you know, general things, but nothing major. You know, no, no major things. What was your first duty station? My first duty station was overseas in Japan. Wow. Uh, it was in a Fuchu Air Station in Japan, a small air base. Uh, outside of Tokyo, okay, is, um, is what it was, and I spent two years there. Did you um Did you take a, a a leave before you went overseas? Did you go back home? I went home for thirty days, okay. and it was a very it? A very interesting thirty days because it was the first time I had been home in six to eight months. Right. Okay. So what does that mean? It was interesting. It it, it was interesting because the world looked different. The outside world looked totally different to me going back home. Because of that orientation? Yeah, uh, because, because of the, 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 the six weeks in basic training, because of the tech school, and all of the things that I had saw um, in that time that I was gone, um, when, I, when I got back home, it was, it was different. Mm -hmm. it, it was definitely totally different for me. Okay. So how long were you in, uh, in Japan? I was in Japan for two years. And what was your job? My job was a communications center specialist, and I worked um, in a communications squadron, which I did most of my career. Um, and our job was a little different than most of the communicators because we worked directly for the Fifth Air Force Command Center, and they were kind of the, the hub of communications for Japan and for kind of that area of the world, you know, at that time, you know, so we worked arm in arm with those folks and, and we saw the things that were happening in Vietnam before everybody else saw them. Okay, we, we saw the communications, we saw the beginnings of the Tet Offensive and things of that nature. We saw it in message format, you know, we knew when things were going to happen that nobody else knew about. What kind of stress was that? What kind of responsibility was it? it? You know, when you look at the fact that I was 18 years old and never been exposed to this type of environment before, uh, it was pretty stressful sometimes, you know. But I found that, it, you know, later on in my life that at 18 years old, stress kind of, you know, rolled off your back and you just kind of went on and said it was a job that I needed to do. Okay, it's what it was. And that's how I handled it. It was a job that, you know, I signed up to do and I was going to do it to the best of my ability. Okay. What about your peers? What about officers? What did you observe? What I observed from a lot of the officers and for a lot of my older peers is that it was stressful for them. Okay, it, it, was, it, was, it was very, very stressful for them because they were leading a double life. I mean, they were involved in a war effort even though they weren't physically on the ground. Okay, they were back in the back as support, right. but then they had to leave there and they had to tend to their families also. What, what do you mean? They had wives there. I mean, they had oh. children there. I mean, you know, and so it was a double-edged sword for them. I mean, you know, because here they were in the midst of sometimes 8 to 12 hours a day knowing that they were supporting a war effort in Vietnam and they had to leave there and they had to chop that off and they had to go home and they had to be dads, you know, to their kids and husbands to their wives. You mean back to the States? No, locally. Locally, right, locally right there in Japan. Because okay. this was not an isolated assignment. This was a joint assignment where families were there. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me, any casualties while you were there in the two-year period? Not that I remember. Um, I, I, I do remember uh, 
uh, some very, very close friends of mine were in a car accident, you know, downtown, in downtown Tokyo at one point. And some of them got, you know, banged up pretty bad, you know, required hospitals. Um, what was the name of the base that you were at? I was at Fuchu Air Station, Japan. Did, um, did casualties from Vietnam come through there? We always had folks from Vietnam that would come through there on their R&Rs. Okay, so we met tons and tons of people that were passing through there on a one week or two week period uh, on their you know, rest and recuperation journeys um, you know, there with us. So we had firsthand information from them as to what was actually going on on the ground there. I mean, it was very services. We weren't limited because we were Air Force. It was Marines, it was Army, it was Navy. All the services came through our base at a point in time on R&R, &R, you know, just to shut down, you know, and all. But there were plenty of stories that we heard. Such as? Oh, we heard stories about battles that they were involved in. We heard stories about casualties that they had to deal with. Um, we heard stories about comrades and friends of theirs that were killed, okay, that they saw killed. I mean, and, and so it, it was pretty, you know, mind-boggling sometimes. Um, did, you, did you get, were you privy to any of the numbers, either from your job or from conversation? Oh, we were privy to all kinds of numbers from our job. We, we, we saw some astounding numbers over there. Fatalities? Uh, yeah, fatalities uh, of, of, of people just disappearing. I mean, there, there were many, many instances of where soldiers just disappeared off the face of the earth, never to be found again. I mean, no bodies, no, no dog tags, no anything. Uh, disabled vets. A lot of disabled vets come through Japan on their way back to the States? At that point, no. Most of the guys that swarmed through Japan where we were were still up and running because they were funneling all of the disabled and the wounded off to the different hospitals, you know, before they took them back to the United States. Okay. We had some major big hospitals over there in the Navy, ran some big hospitals there that kind of took care of a lot of the wounded folks that were aired back out of Vietnam and brought to Japan, you know, before they were ready to, you know, be sent back to the United States. Okay. Um, so, how you said you were there for two years. I was there for two years. I meant to ask you, uh, did you retire from the military? Yes, I did. How many years? I did uh, 24 years. Okay. No, I didn't do 24 years. I did 26 years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I did 26 years. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I kept the numbers in my head for so long, and it was like 24, 26 years, 11 months, and 16 days. Okay. It's exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I see nobody was counting. So anyway, no. <laughs> um, so what was your next uh, duty station after uh, Japan? My next duty station, unbelievably, oh. was home. Um, yes. While you were in, where, where did you take your R and R while you were in Japan? There, I mean, for us, there was no such thing as an R and R. I mean, there, I was on a two-year assignment, uh -huh. uh, and when my two years was up, I came home. Okay, so. If you didn't take any vacation time, you did get weekends off. Oh yeah, we had weekends off. Did you travel around Japan or experience I, people in the economy and how was the food? Oh, now that's another lifestyle I'll, 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 I'll tell you about. Um, there was tons of entertainment there in Japan as far as discos and things of that nature. And this is where my um, curiosity got got really peaked as far as music was concerned. Okay. Uh, because um, when I was younger and participated in the drum and bugle corps, I couldn't play the bugle or the drums, so I just marched and was not able to master any of the instruments. So what happened when I was in Japan, uh, I kind of got really into the music scene, you know, as far as um, disc jockey. Was concerned, it's kind of you know piqued my curiosity big time, you know as far as you know well I can't you know really you know play instruments but you know I can take this music and present it to people in a different fashion. 
So that kind of started something that's lasted with me for, since then, since 1967, 68, and it's still with me today as really? far as music is concerned. And when we get down the road, I'll tell you some more stories about my things with music. Okay. Yeah. I'm anxious. So anyway, <laughs> here. I, did you do it professionally at one time? I never did it professionally, but um, I did d develop the, uh, a job as a disc jockey. Okay. It, it was major at, at, a, at a point in time on my, on my second tour in Japan, which we'll get to down the road there. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I'll be patient. So anyway, okay. <laughs> where was your next tour? My, my next tour was at home at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland. Oh, okay. Was, you know, stones threw away from you know where we lived and I did not realize it until later on in my career that my stepfather had kind of had a hand in this whole reassignment for me once I left Japan because I had volunteered to take a tour in Vietnam and it did not go through and the next thing I know I had an assignment going back to the Washington DC Maryland area and I found out years later that my stepfather was a personnel type guy and he managed to finagle the system a bit to get me back home, okay, is, is, is what it was. And I have to be honest with you, the two years that I spent in that area was not good for me. I did not like it at all. You know, back I, in the States. Back in the States. I, I did not like it at all. I did not like being at home because I was now in an environment where I was forced to get a lot of driver's license because I didn't have a driver's license when I left to go overseas. I didn't need one. Okay. And um, I got back and I had to get a driver's license because the buses stopped running at 12 midnight <laughs> and I worked at night, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I had probably one of the best jobs that you could have military-wise because we uh, were the communications link for presidential support. Oh. Uh, so um, we supported the presidential support aircrafts, you know, when they went up in the air and flew the president all over the world. Who was the president at that time? You know, if you ask me today, I, I can't even remember who it was. <laughs> and I've got to be honest with you, I, I, we'd have to look in the records to see who it was. But I know the only thing I remember, one thing that stuck in my mind was that Henry Kissinger was in his position at that particular time. Well, it had to be. Either Richard Nixon or John F. Kennedy. It wasn't Kennedy because Kennedy was gone. Then it was Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, it, was, it must have been Lyndon Johnson. Okay. okay, but Kissinger stuck in my mind because Kissinger um, would fly all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this was before him and Nancy were married. Okay, okay. Nancy, is he married Nancy? Nancy Kissinger. Okay, she lived in New York, I think, and. He would fly to New York on the plane and fly her back to Washington, spend the weekends together, and then he would fly her back on an airplane by herself. Uh -huh. And the reason why I remember all of this is because we monitored all the aircrafts, presidential aircrafts that flew in and out. And when she flew home, the plane would come back to Andrew's land, and we would get a call that the lobster and you know steak dinners were left on the planes, and that we were free to come down and pick up what we wanted to eat, you know, at night. You know, so we had lobster and steak dinners. Um, I got to know one of the presidential pilots personally, Colonel Albert Tassi, was one of the presidential pilots, and I got to know him personally because I worked a midnight shift, and we bumped into each other in the hallway one night, and. He did not realize that there were communicators in the building at night supporting his command staff. Right. And so he opened up his office at night to our communicators and allowed us to go into his office and have sodas from his refrigerator and chips from his refrigerator and watch DVD movies. <laughs> uh, so what? So far, I'm, I'm in the dark. What is it about this tour that you dislike so? I, I, the, the, the few friends that I had that were left there, they were different than 
what I the kind of lifestyle I was used to, uh, you know, uh, in, anymore. You know, there were a lot of things that they liked to do that, you know, just didn't hold interest to me anymore. You know, is uh, is what it was, and I knew that that was not the place for me to be. So I started immediately working to get an assignment out of out of Washington D.C. I mean, you know, um, I. Uh, Living at home was different for me, living back at home, because I had an option of moving into Barracks and living at home, and my mom wanted me to come home and live, but that was, for me, was a little different because there were things that I wasn't used to, like the door being locked at 10 o'clock at night, you know? I was used to being able to go and come as I please, you know, as long as I was on work at time, you know, time and everything, you know? So, um, those things made it just, not a, a happy place for me to be. Besides that, besides that, mm -hmm. you know, issue that you had, mm -hmm. um, how did you get along with officers and your peers, and were you continuing your education? At that particular point in time, no, I was not doing anything with my education because, you know, I was back home and, you know, trying to get myself sorted out as, as far as, you know, what's the next step for me? next step for me was not going to be staying there, okay, because okay. in my mind it was, you know, that I had to leave there to be able to continue, you know, the path that I wanted to take, you know. Okay. Had you formulated, how old were you by now? By you, then I was 20 years old. 20 years old. Yeah. Was, so had you formulated in your mind yet the direction that you wanted to go, either as far as your career or as far as uh, what you wanted to get a, a degree in? No. No, that, that was the last thing on my mind. The only thing on my mind was I wanted to leave Washington to Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. It was the only thing that was on my mind. Okay. All right. Um, so, did you put in for your next tour? Or yes, you, I did. did you just or get orders to go? So, oh, what did you put in for? I put in to go back to Japan. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> and so, and you got to go. I my my wishes were granted. So so, how long was this next tour? This next tour was four years. Okay. And what was your assignment now? My what? assignment, believe it or not, was to the same communications outfit that I was assigned to before. The only difference is is that before I physically departed the United States, their location moved from the small air base that it was originally at to a larger air base down the road from them, but the functions were the same. They just had a larger, a larger mission. Okay. I went right back to the same organization. How many people were you stationed with this time? Oh, it, it was humongous. Really? I mean, yeah, it, it was massive. It was a massive air base because they provided the, the transport. They were kind of a transport base that you know, the planes flew in there to refuel, they flew in there to go to Vietnam and to come in and out of Vietnam uh, at this at this particular base. It was Yokota Air Base Japan is where it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, what about your music now? Well, this is where the music career really, really got big. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, what year is it now? This now is... We, it is now 1972. Okay. 1972. Yeah, 1972 was when I left the United States to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. And you were there for another two years, right? I was there for four years. Four years? Four years. So you were there from 72 to 76? Yes, 72 to 76 I was there at communications. Okay, so how did your life progress? How was the food? <laughs> food? Food was fantastic. Um, and I kind of picked up where I left off because when I left Japan the first time, I had started to be able to read some of uh, the I can speak you know, Japanese. But I, I learned the language uh, to the point where I could maneuver myself around anywhere I wanted to go mm -hmm. uh, is what it was. Um, I won't say I was fluent in it, but I had a good handle on the language, understanding it and speaking it. Um, what about uh, traveling on the economy now? You did it for four years, so you had some some, some oh, other places. That Mount Fuji, 
We, was uh, okay. definitely, we definitely went to Mount Fuji. Right. Um, uh, all over Tokyo. I mean, Tokyo was just, I mean, it was right at our, our arm's length. I mean, we could go to Tokyo any weekends that we wanted to go to Tokyo. How'd you get there? Uh, usually by train. Okay. Usually we would take the, 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 the train here. How far were you from uh, Tokyo? I'd have to say the train ride to Tokyo probably was about a 30, 40 minute ride. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's what it was. I had a vehicle, so I was able to drive places. I mean, but a lot of times you park your car and hop on the train versus driving because driving was, mm -hmm. you know, still a little, you know, sketchy because you're on, you know. Did you, did you get to any other places on that side of the world, so to speak? Did you get to Korea? Korea? Yeah. Uh -huh. Korea was the place we went to get all of our clothes made. Oh. Okay. It was, really, really, it was cheaper to go there to get our clothes made than you go to Korea. Get our clothes made, but as far as assignment wise, mm -hmm. I my assignment was right there in Japan. Okay. That's where my so you didn't get to Australia. No, didn't get to Australia at all. Did you get to Hawaii at all? Uh, I went to Hawaii on our way out of Japan. Right. Is when, I went, is when I went to Hawaii. Okay. Uh, when, I, when I went out of Japan is when I went to Hawaii. But the music thing really kicked off big because um, I reconnected with one of my friends that. I knew when I was there the first time, okay, and he was still there, and um, we reconnected, and um, we started working a local club as disc jockeys, right, and from there we wound up in a major, um, um, and, and I want to say, meeting discussion with. Some gentlemen who we later found out were the Japanese mafia, uh, uh, but we wound up in a, a major discussion with them because they were purchasing a huge discotheque in a town outside of Tokyo, and they wanted some American disc jockeys there. And and my friend, he was totally fluent in Japanese and. You know, I was the guy that was responsible for getting the pictures of people that we wanted them to hire and resumes and things of that nature. And we sat down with them and we worked a deal with them where we would go into this club and work this club as disc jockeys. Well, I had a major concern because we all had security clearances. And I had to make sure that we were doing things that we were doing were legal. Right. So I went over to the Air Force legal side and said, here's what we're doing. You know, we don't want anybody to think we're doing anything illegal. We want this vetted before we go too far into this thing. Okay. And they said, you know, as long as there are no drugs involved, you know, as long as you all keep us aware of what you're doing and you bring us all the paperwork that you're signing and negotiating with, and our legal people vet it, you're okay. And it wound up being something way larger than we expected it to be because we would get off the train, we would take the train down there many nights to go play our music and the disc jockey, and the kids would be waiting for us at the train station. And I understood what people that were famous went through because the kids would chase us for autographs and for pictures and things of this nature, you know, and, but the, the, the interesting thing was is that the, the gentlemen that I worked with, uh, the military guys that I worked with, they were never, I, I, I want to say they never got the big head about this, you know, they were just kind of down to earth about it and, and they said, We'll sign every kid's autograph that we could possibly sign. We'll take every photograph we could take. But it, they never got big-headed about it. Okay. You know, uh, it, it, it was like, for them, it, it, we, we all thought it was, you know, well, this is nice, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, to be honest with you, the money was very nice because it, it provided us with Japanese money where we didn't have to take our American money and convert it over, is, is what happened. Uh, so, I mean, it, it was, for a lot of us, it, it was, you know, a breath of fresh air is, is, uh, is what it was. 
Um, one of the things that spun off from that for me was I was asked to um, take the bullet train and go to, I think it was Osaka, Japan I went to. Was it Osaka? I, I went somewhere on the bullet train in Japan because they wanted me to do a cameo appearance in a um, TV program. Okay. I had no idea that this TV program was their Sunday night soap opera program. It was one of the biggest programs that they had going at that particular time in Japan. And I caught the bullet train and I arrived um, in Osaka, Japan. And when I got off the train, this limousine pulls up, greets me, puts me in the back of the limousine, takes me to the hotel. And they bring an interpreter in, you know, for me, and they explain to me that, you know, well, you're going to do bits and pieces in this TV program, you know. I'm like, okay. And they said, we're going to put you in an army uniform. You're going to be an army guy, you know, that, you know, they found, you know, in the woods and everything. And it was just mind-boggling, you know, all of this happened. And it was in a 24, 48-hour period. I mean, I went in, we shot the... the clips that they wanted to shoot right in this particular uh, movie in this particular TV show rather and they fed me that evening the next morning they got up they took me back to the bullet train and the automobile and back to the, you know back to the base that I went uh -huh. and I thought nothing of it until Monday morning I got up Monday morning did my usual stop in the donut shop on base to um, pick up some donuts for the guys in the office. And the ladies in the donut shop just went crazy when they saw me. And I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? And they said, we saw you on TV last night. You know, you were in the show, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, they said, didn't you realize? And I, I said, no. They said, millions of people saw you, wow. you know? I had no idea. Was that in black and white or color? It was in color. Okay. I mean, it was, I mean, you know, I had no idea it was that big, you know? And I mean, I, I couldn't, you know, it was kind of like, you know, I felt uneasy going back into the donut shop after that because every time I went in, it was like, he's back, he's back, he's back, you know? But, you know, I had no idea that it was that big, you know, that this show was that big. But I did the research on it and it was, Huge. Did you get paid? I got paid. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I got paid. I mean, you know, but it was kind of like that. I wasn't even thinking about the pay. No, I, I understand. I was curious. It was, yeah, but yeah, I, I got paid. <laughs> so that um, answers the question that you uh, had good relationship with the Japanese people. Oh, on your absolutely. Economy. Oh, okay. totally, totally. I mean, I was just engrossed in their economy. I, I got to tell you, I mean. It was, I mean, just went, and everywhere you went, you were just accepted. And it had nothing to do with that show. Okay. You know, that was just the way those people were. I understand. Okay, um, so the next tour, where, where are we going? Small pit stop here, because to leave Japan was coming up, uh, I got married. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I got married, yeah. I got married, and my wife at that time was active through the Air Force also. Oh. Okay. So we wound up having to do some negotiating to kind of do joint spouse travel and everything because uh, we got married, oh, I'd have to say, it was six or seven months before we were supposed to leave. Yeah, before you were supposed to leave. Supposed to leave, yeah. I mean, we wound up leaving, I think, in April, I want to say April of 70, I can tell you exactly what it was. I'm going to tell you exactly what it was. We left there in April of 76. Yeah, we left there in April of 76. Wow, yeah, I guess we did. Yeah, April of '76, we left. We left Japan. So you you were able to work it out. Yeah, we were able to work it out and everything. So yeah. where, did, where did where did you go? Where was the next duty station? The next duty station was back close to home. 
Um, but it was at an Army base, okay? Uh, we were at Fort Meade. Uh, and there, we worked for the civilian sector, National Security Agency. Is that in Virginia? Uh, no, that's in Maryland. Okay. Yeah, it's in Odenton, Maryland. And how long was the tour? Uh, the tour there was three years. Okay. Yeah, was, what did the wife do, if you don't mind me asking? She was still on active duty. Oh, really? Yeah, she, we, we served together right there on active duty uh, at Fort Meade. Um, and she had a job in the building, National Security Agency. I had a job in the building, National Security Agency. NSA? Yeah, NSA. Wow. And we wore civilian clothes. Okay, but, but have you become an officer by now? Or no, you're still enlisted? I'm still enlisted. Okay, no. what, rank, what rank are you? Uh, at this time, I was a staff sergeant in E5. E5? Yeah. What about your wife? My wife was a E4 okay. sergeant. Yeah, she was a sergeant E4. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we we were there, and during our time there, our first child was born. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, our first child was born. <laughs> yes, Jason Eric was born there. And so it was quite interesting. Um, the assignment was, was quite interesting assignment, um, working with the civilians there. Um, but, um, well, can you divulge what the assignment was? It, again, I worked in a communications facility. Uh, they afforded us an opportunity once my son was born for us to work alternate schedules so we didn't have to worry about a babysitter, okay, when he was first born, you know. You know, I was home, you know, in the daytime. She was home in the evenings and in, in, in night, um, so our schedules were opposite schedules. Right. I mean, as far as that's concerned, we were off on weekends always together, of course. Nice. Um, but they adjusted our schedules so they didn't conflict and force us into having to have a, a babysitter for our baby, you know, at, at any point in time. You know? Okay. How, and how long? How long were you at Fort Meade? I was at Fort Meade for three years. Did you get to travel around the country, or did you? What did you do? Now you, I know you're married now, so you yeah. had to take some vacation. Oh yeah, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, we did our traveling uh, because uh, uh, she, her parents were up north in uh, in the main area, so we traveled up there into the main area. It was a 45 minute drive to get in to the other side where my mom and sisters were at that particular point in time in Maryland because we were out further in Overton, Maryland, you know, so we had to do the Baltimore Washington Parkway thing and, you know, 295 thing to get over to where they were, but we got to visit there. Um, my dad um, was in uh, Indiana. Uh, him and my stepmom uh, relocated uh, to Indiana. Yeah, they had relocated by that time to Indiana, so they were in Indiana, in Indiana at that time. So we kind of got to, you know, move around and do some traveling. So it was the early 80s now? 1980s? Uh, no, it was 76. 76 to... Poof. 79? Yeah, I think it was 70, yeah. 70, 76. Yeah, 76 to 79. Okay, uh -huh. so off the top of your head, what was the most memorable story that you had to tell about that three-year period? The probably the most memorable story about that three-year period would of course, be the birth of my son, right? But the the other memorable story was the fact that uh, I did jump back into the books again while I was there, and uh, I managed to capture my uh, associate's degree at Anne Arundel Community College. Uh, and I, I guess the thing was, I, I met a, a friend of mine. He was in the Navy. Um, his name was Joe Decker. Uh -huh. Never will forget as long as I live. He was a Navy guy. And him and I had this Army, this Air Force, Navy battle in school <laughs> because we took all the same classes and everything. And um, we were always trying to best each other as far as grades were concerned. We both wound up graduating from community college, summa cum laude, you know, I mean, we were straight A students at the end. Congratulations. And it was hilarious, I mean, you know, but we, we, we did that. And, and I think that one of the, 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 the best things about our friendship was is, is, is that he was kind of like a brother to me. Um, and, and so we, we did a lot of things together. We studied together. Um, he had dinner with us, you know, a lot. Um, he and I um, took a graduation trip to Atlantic City. Neither one of us had never been there before. He, we knew nothing about gambling. We couldn't care less about gambling, you know, at that point in our lives. But we went to Atlantic City and, um, 
just for the weekend, just to say we did something different. Mm -hmm. You know, that was our graduation treat to ourselves. We went there and um, we saw a couple of shows and we put some money in the slot machine and we didn't know what we were doing, but we hit a jackpot and it paid for the whole trip. You know, the whole trip got paid for because okay. the jackpot was worth the slot machine, so it was really hilarious. How much was it for? Oh, it was probably seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. Okay. I mean, it was, it was, that, and that time it was big. I mean, right. you know, so like I said, pay for the trip if we had tons of money left over, you know. So, I mean, my wife was ecstatic when we got back home. I came back home and said, hey, here's all the money you put back in the bank. Cause she said, where'd you get it from? I said, well, we played the stock machine and we won. Paid for the trip, and so we got all the money back, you know. And all. But him and I stayed friends for years. We lost contact with each other. Um, and I think the other thing that was memorable for me there was at the end of the tour when I knew time was up and I was leaving and I was not going to see him anymore. He, my wife and I, um, dropped my son off at my mom's to babysit and we went downtown Washington, D.C. and we toured all of Washington, D.C. again. Oh, okay. and for me, that was fantastic because I had not really had a chance to tour it. The last time I remember being in Washington, D.C. touring when I was a kid in grade school, mm -hmm. you know, but it brought back memories. I mean, we got on a tour bus at Union Station and rode all over, sort of changing the guard, you know, everything that you could possibly see, we went and saw in that day. And it, it stayed in my mind, and to this day it stays in my mind, the trip that we took to Washington, D.C. Um, that particular point in time. What was the next tour? Next tour was Howard Air Force Base in Panama. That's where it was. That's where Mr. Noriega was. Okay. Yeah. Noriega was there. How long were you there? I was there for four years. And what was that like? That was interesting. Very interesting because it regurgitated me bringing back my Spanish that I talk, took in high school. Okay. That I hated when I was in high school, but I was so thankful that I took it when I got to the Panama. Right. Okay. And um, I, I asked for a refresher course in, in Spanish when I got there, and I lasted about two or three days because the instructor kicked me out of class because she says, you don't need a refresher course in Spanish. I need a refresher course in Spanish. You speak it better than I do, you know? Huh? But um, mm -hmm. it, it was interesting because it was kind of like I never forgot it. Right. You know, and this, and I hadn't spoke Spanish in years. But after a week or two, she says, ah, she says, somebody else probably needs a seat more than you do, you know? So, um, so what was your job and what was that tour like being there um, in, in that zone? Under uh, Nor while while uh, Nor President Norias Noriega yeah. was in power, it, it it was it was quite interesting because we saw the change in power as he started to lose his power and and we knew that certain things were going to happen. We were, again, being a communicator, we were privy to a lot of information that other people weren't privy to. You know, so we knew that things were going to happen before they happened. You know, but it was kind of a you, no, 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 no talk thing. You can't right. talk about it. You know? Did you witness a lot of violence? Not, a, not a lot of violence. A lot of corruption. Huh. Yeah, there was there was a lot of corruption there because um, the, the military folks were, you know, they weren't getting paid, and so you know they did things and, and, and not bad corruption, but it was monetary corruptions that we witnessed there. What country was that again? It was Panama. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so you're talking about people not getting paid. That's the Panamanian no, so military. Yeah, they, they, they weren't getting just pay. Okay. They, they weren't getting uh, just pay for the services that they were performing there. So they were involved in a lot of corruption. They were they were involved in a lot of corruption. Okay. A lot a lot of corruption. And again, it, it wasn't it wasn't drugs or anything like that. It was just that they would do favors for people for money. Uh -huh. Okay, and they would do favors for us for money. Okay. You know, if we went into a facility and the line was all the way out the door, if we put five dollars in our package, we would get to the front of the line. Okay. You know, it's it's kind of the types of corruption that, that they were involved in. You know, but there's no no killing corruption. We we never saw them. You know, do you know massive bodily damage to anybody there. You know, but um, again, we were aware of a lot of changes that were going to take place in Panama. Okay. Now. Career-wise at Panama was where my some of my major decisions were made. Okay. Okay, because I had the the um, the 
blessing to have a couple of bosses that cared about what happened to me, you know, and they started looking at my career because I was up at around the 13 year point by this time. Mm -hmm. And they started looking at my career and you know, my capability. And this is where the decision was made to do for me as a, um, a military person to stay as an enlisted or to switch over into the officer's corps. Mm -hmm. This is where I, I, had, I, I made the decision. And um, I had two very, very great bosses there um, that kind of mentored me, um, Joe Parker and Tim Alf. Um, uh, and to this day, I still keep in touch with them. Okay. Okay. Um, I still keep in touch with them. But they mentored me during my tour there. And uh, my, my big boss at that particular time was a captain who had previously been an enlisted guy. Oh, all right. And I never will forget the day we sat down in his office and he looked at me and he said, you have the potential, he said, to be a great officer. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, you know, he said, I went this route. He said, I was a listed guy and I went this route. And he said, I really wish you would give this a lot of thought, you know, about you know, becoming an officer. He says, because the potential is absolutely there. He, he said, you be able to do some great things, you know. I said, okay, sir, I'll think about it. And, and I gave it some serious thought. Uh -huh. And what had happened on my way to Panama before we left uh, the United States, I got notified that I had got selected for E6 for tech sergeant. Uh -huh. So I knew that I was going to pin on E6 while I was there. And I kind of looked at myself and I said, you're at the midpoint career, you know, and, you know, do you really want to give all of this up that you put in as an enlisted guy to start over again as an officer and be a little guy on the totem pole again? Ah. Okay, it's, it's what I had to wrestle with, you know, in, 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 my, in my mind. Right. And my ultimate decision was, is that, no, that if I was going to channel any energy in you, it was going to be channeling it as an enlisted person and, and doing what I could do with the rest of my career as an, as an enlisted person. And so um, what I did was um, I sat down um, with Joe Parker and Tim Alf and said, okay, you know, 13 years have gone by and I finally figured what I want to be when I grow up. Okay. What I told them. And I said, this is what I want to do, you know. And so Joe Parker looked at me and said, well, okay, first step is you got to get out of here. You got to go to NCO Academy. And I had fought him about it when I got there. And I said, okay, boss, I'll go do it. And I went off to NCO Academy for six to eight weeks. And I did that. And when I came back, Tim Alf says, you want that next strike? He said, you want it first time up? He says, you got to hit the books. So I hit the books, and lo and behold, the kid who came there to Panama as the E6 selectee who pinned on E6 there and who was the lowest ranking E6 in all the communicators there on the base, when time came for promotion to E7, Got picked. Congratulations. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it kind of set off a furor in the organization because there were guys that were way older than I was that had competed with me when we were <laughs> made E6, and now I'm the E7, right. and they're still the E6. So there was some unhappy campers there. Okay. Um, but my boss said, "You did what you needed to do. You got promoted." You need to press them, and that's and, what I did. In lieu of what occurred, how did the the the, the racial atmosphere surrounding you 
did it did it change? Was you know were there epithets or? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it, it, it changed. It changed. It changed drastically. It changed drastically. Um, How did that affect your performance? Um, it, it was it was tough. It it, 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 was, it was very very tough because as my cadre of bosses that I had had there for the first three years I was there started to depart, the arena around me started to change. And I ran into a major brick wall after I had sold on E7 as I um, inherited a boss who just didn't like me. Okay, and to this day, I still don't know why he didn't like me, and uh, you know, but uh, he didn't like me, and uh, he was, I don't know what it was, he just didn't like all the things that I had done, and all the things I had accomplished, the, my, my previous bosses had left me with everything that I needed, they said, we really don't want you to stay another year, but if that's your choice, you stay, but here's everything you need to get out of this door next year. Uh -huh. And here's your award that's already written. All you have to do is add the last things you do in this last year. You know, you know, Godspeed is what they told me. And I said, okay, and I left. And it was a horrendous last year in Panama because I was working for a guy that just didn't like me. And his last bullet that he threw at me was, my first performance appraisal as a senior NCO was in E7. Um, he wrote it, and while it wasn't an awful performance appraisal, he gave me one ding in one area that he knew would haunt me the rest of my career, is what it was. And I had no idea because back then you never saw your performance appraisal until they were a matter of record. Mm -hmm. And a young lady that worked in the orderly room, who handled all the performance appraisals that came in the organization, lived across the street from me. And one night she came over to my house, knocked on my door, crying with a sealed envelope. <laughs> okay. And she said, "This is horrible," you know. And she says, "This is the only thing I can do," you know. And she said, "Please don't tell anybody I did this." And I said, okay. And she gave me this envelope and she left. And I opened the envelope and then there was a copy of my performance appraisal. And while it was a very well written performance appraisal, he made sure that one category was marked down. And, um, and that was acceptance of NCO responsibilities or performance of NCO duties or something like that. And, right. And he used some jaded numbers that he managed to pull out of the books on all of our statistics and stuff. And um, so this was something that I knew that I was going to have to battle at some point in my career. And so I left Panama with a bitter taste in my mouth. Sure you did. Okay. And um, from there, the next assignment was Scott Air Force Base, which was our communications headquarters, which is who I had worked for all of my career was communications headquarters save for the three years that I worked for National Security Agency, everything else was under the big communications command. And I got there and I initiated the battle to remove this performance appraisal. And me not knowing the system the first time around, it took them less than two weeks and they disapproved it. Right. And so I knew the battle was going to have to start again. And I just wasn't up to fighting the battle. But I had a boss there, Charlie Caldwell, uh -huh. who was going to fight the battle. <laughs> he was going to make me fight the battle. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what happened was when I did not come up the first time on the E8 selection list, he wanted to know what happened, why my board score was so low. And that's when we dug into the performance appraisal. And I told him, there's a performance appraisal and that's not good. And he said, okay, here the answer is, you're going to see the colonel, and the colonel's going to figure out what's the next step. I go see the colonel, the colonel says, you're going to see the other colonel, and we're going to get this fixed. And 
Um, that's what happened. I mean, uh, it took right about a year, and I worked with a colonel who I had no idea until after we got into the throes of trying to fix this problem, he had served as the commander of the Air Force communications um, board that corrected all of the erroneous reports and records and stuff. Wow. And so he was an expert at this and he questioned me for eight hours in his office. And when the eight hours were over, he said, I'm very sorry to put you through this. He says, but I had to know if this was valid or not. And it's definitely right. valid. He says, but there's a lot of work you're going to have to do. And it took me a good six to eight months to put everything in writing the way it had to be in order to be put back in. And when it was done, after tons and tons of paper being thrown away and red marked and everything, one day I went in his office and said, it's done. And I said, really? He said, I have one more phone call to make. And I said, you do? He said, yeah. He says, I have to call General Edmonds. And General Edmonds at the time was now a two-star general. But he had been our one-star general when I was in Panama. Okay. And he had the final signing of that performance appraisal that was not good. And he called him. And he knew him personally, and he said, this is Ted Kubiak, sir, I have your Master Sergeant Wilson sitting here. You signed a performance appraisal on him two years ago when he left out of Panama. He said, wasn't a good thing. You had no idea that it was not a good thing. You did the thing you're supposed to do as a general. You signed it when they put it in front of you. He says, we need a letter from you. And the general says, okay, I'll be there in another week. General letter letter up, have somebody bring it to me, I'll sign it. General gets there two weeks, a good friend of mine, to me, Captain, is take this escort officer, military personnel. meets him at the airport, drives him back. I take the military base, personnel, General signs the letter, and Colonel gives it to me, he says, take this package. In less than two weeks, it came back approved. The performance appraisal was expunged from my records. Now by this time, I had tested, promotion tested two more times for EA. The second time I had tested again, I had gotten turned down. Well, as it would be, because now this performance appraisal was a matter of record, when the third package of me went in, I got approved for promotion to EA. Well, unbeknownst to us, Air Force had went back and said, well, we got to look at the last two times that he competed for promotion also, because that performance appraisal was there and it shouldn't have been there. So they went back and they rescored my records for the previous two promotion cycles. On the first promotion cycle, they said no promotion. But on the second promotion cycle, they said, well, wait a minute. The score was way high enough for promotion. So they backed my promotion up two promotion cycles. And so instead of me having to wait for a sequence number for the third promotion cycle, they promoted me immediately to E8. Uh -huh. And that was, I mean, you know, just unbelievable. I mean, it was just totally unbelievable. And the one thing that I was told by the colonel that helped me do this, the one thing he asked me to do, he said, there's one thing I'm going to ask you to do for the rest of your career. If you ever come across someone who has this type of problem, give them what I gave you. It's what he asked me to do. So you're senior master sergeant now, right? Yeah, so now I'm a senior master sergeant. Did you make chief? Yes, I did. <laughs> Congratulations. I sure did. Um, okay. Is, did we get through? <laughs> yeah. So what was the next? Next assignment? Next tour. Next tour was uh, just a 
uh, okay, what kind of job do you want now? <laughs> I don't know, you know. And it popped up that there was a NATO assignment out there, a two-year NATO assignment in Verona, Italy. Oh. Oh, this was just, you know, like, oh, this is, you know, unbelievable, you know. And interestingly enough, take the family with you. Uh, no. Oh. Um, no. Interestingly enough, none of my communications leaders knew anything about this NATO assignment because they had been in communications, you know, Air Force communications all their lives. Right. And so it was a different ballpark, you know. Nobody could tell me, well, you know, yeah, I think you should go take it. We don't know, you know, you've been in battle. So I was charged with doing all the research on my own. And I did the research. How long was the tour? Two years. Two years. Okay. Two years too. And I did the research and found out from one of the guys that had been there, one of my good friends that I had went to NCO Academy with, he told me, he says, let me tell you something. That assignment is an automatic promotion to Chief Master Sergeant. He, he, went me. he said, all you have to do is go there and keep your nose clean and you're going to get promoted. He said, there's only one guy that sat in that seat and didn't get promoted. And the only reason why he didn't get promoted because he was on the weight control program and they couldn't promote him. Wow. And I'm like, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, go there and keep your nose clean. So I go bounding off to Verona, Italy. Right. Would you believe that the first night I was in Verona, Italy, that I got to go see Ray Charles in concert? Okay. What year was that? That was in 19... 88. Okay. Yeah, 1988. I got to see him in concert. The first night I was in Verona, Italy. I got off an airplane, he picked me up, and he said, Hey, Ray Charles is in concert right down the street here in Verona, Italy. You know, you're going with us. And so off I went to the concert to see Ray Charles in concert. Did Ray say hello? Oh yeah, he said hello when he got out of the limousine. He said hello to everybody. You know, is, is what it was. But uh, I got to see Ray, Ray, Ray Charles. And interestingly enough, um, Italy was was different, um, but it was it was a, it was a good assignment. I got to do a lot of traveling while I was in Italy. Where'd you go? I got to go um, to um, Germany tons of times. I got to go to the Oktoberfest every year. Two years I was here, I got to go to the October Okay. Okay, absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I went up to Switzerland, up into the mountains in Switzerland. Um, I even got on skis one time. I never <laughs> been on skis before. My life. I got on skis. Uh, I think the, the most exciting thing for me was being on ski lift more than being on the skis. Okay. You know, but I mean, just just saw it absolutely all. Germany was only. Uh, less than two hour drive away from us. We were only two hours from the German border. Right. So we could go into Garmin's Park and Kirchen anytime we wanted to and um, go there and have German food and see, you know, um, American movies and all kinds of good stuff over there. It was, you know, absolutely fantastic. So I did get to do a, a lot of travel. So overall, it was a relatively easy assignment? It was relatively easy. And, and relative. you got to broaden your, your worldview, of course, oh, by being able to travel. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. it, 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 was absolutely a, a great assignment, and then then to make to make chief master sergeant there was just icing on the cake. I mean, you think was the requirement was there a requirement for you to have a bachelor's degree? Uh, no, it was never. It was never a requirement for me to have a bachelor's degree. You know, but I kept pushing on. You know, saying that you know at some point you know I, I need to you know do this. You know, but you know by that time I mean you know they were the, the promotion system had changed drastically because pictures were pulled out of the promotion files now, you know, so it was never a color barrier for that portion of promotion anymore, you know. Um, th there were things that I found out about the promotion system um, uh, years later that even the promotion test that they instituted for us, they rewrote them because they discovered that the education quality for minorities was not that great. And things such as accept, but, and not, 
that were in promotion questions uh -huh. were being missed. They were being missed. They found this out. So they discovered this, the element of discrimination. They discovered the element of discrimination in the writing of the promotion testing, okay. because and it wasn't it wasn't purpose on purpose, but what it was because when they started looking at the tallies of the, the questions that were being answered wrong, and they start piecing it together, and they're like, whoa, there's a problem here. We need to fix it. And so what they did was they rewrote the exam, the promotion exams, and the accepts and the buts and the nots, the first fixed action was to italicize them. So they stood out when you took a promotion test. Okay. Okay, it's what they did. Okay, in an effort to fix that. Okay. And again, one of the other things that they did along the way was they pulled all the pictures out of the promotion packages. Okay. Because E8s and E9s were being selected by a board at that particular time. And there was only one exam that you took now, one written exam that you took by that time I was testing for promotion. But they pulled all the pictures out of the packages also. That's one of the things that they did down the road. Pictures. What do you mean when you say pictures? Photographs. Of you in uniform. Oh, I'm missing the connection. Okay, in your promotion package, you're looking for a board. And in there were all of your performance appraisals, okay, was all of your decorations, uh -huh. all of your years in service, mm -hmm. and a photograph of you. And how were they able to utilize that? They were able to see it. The promotion board was able to see the that, that you actually got. That's right. Uh, some, who, who was it that. Who, who denied. Why did you even have to prove that? They, they, they had pictures. They, they, they had always had pictures in promotion packages, and they found out that people were being discriminated against because wow. of pictures in promotion packages. Correct. And so they pulled them out. I never heard of that ever. Yeah, they, they pulled them out. They pulled all the pictures out of promotion packages. They, all the they pulled the pictures out of your package. They pulled them out, and then so there was no proof. Uh, no physical proof of being able to see that you had already advanced. There was there was no physical proof to be able to see you were a cover. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't I see you were a cover anymore? Okay. Yeah. They had there were no pictures to distinguish you between this other guy now. Wow. Yeah. I never heard of anything like that. Yep. Okay, so moving right along, thank you for clearing that up for me. Okay. Um Two years, mm -hmm. we're getting close to retirement. Well, we were getting close to retirement until I took an assignment to England. Okay, and how long was that tour? That was a four-year tour. Okay, and that was the last one. That was it. Yeah. So where in England were you? I was at a small British base called RAF Uxbridge, which housed the British band played there. They, they, that, was, that was their home station. It was a big British band for the House Royal Air Force. How far from London? Uh, about 20, 30 minutes. Oh, okay. The stones were away from London. So you got to experience London? Oh, I got to experience London. Did you go to Scotland and uh, Yes, I went to Scotland. Ireland? I went to Scotland. Didn't go to Ireland, but I did go to Scotland. Okay. Yeah, I went to Scotland. Um, I had a great time in Scotland. Uh, loved London. London was absolutely fantastic. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was, it was abs absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So what was, what was the job? The was job there, I was now Chief Master Sergeant, and I was uh, Chief of Operations. Okay, chief of operations. Okay, but the interesting thing about um, being there and, and being chief of operations, um, and there were some changes that happened in my life there because my oldest son came to live. But um, one of the things that that uh, uh, I ran into my first week there was that. The armed forces um, place that ran the BXs, AFES, right, um, were operating a barber shop on one of the larger bases in England, uh, RAF Upper Hayford, and they had seven or eight barbers in the barber shop, but only one barber could cut black hair, <laughs> and so. What I saw was the young airmen that came in to get their haircuts had 
extensive wait times to get their hair cut. Right. And I just happened to stumble upon it on a weekend that I was there going to get a haircut. Okay. And I saw these kids sitting there waiting to get haircuts and I came in and pulled the number. And I watched as the numbers were being called and their numbers weren't being called. And I'm like, why is your number not being called? And that's when they told me. They said, because only one of the barbers can cut black hair. Okay. And I said, so you have to wait? And they said, yes, we have to wait for haircut. And they said, and it causes us problems at work because we get yelled at because it takes us so long. It takes so long. long. Right. And so I asked the manager of the eight fees barbershop, how come these other folks were working here and could not cut black hair? And he said to me, well, we haven't gotten trained. And I said, but you can't punish these kids because AFES has not got the barbers trained. Exactly. And I said, what are you guys going to do about it? And he says, we don't know what to do. And I said, well, I said, I think what we're going to have to do today is, it's Sunday, and you're going to have to close the barbershop. And he said, but I can't close the barbershop. And I said, well, I says, I can have the security police come over and have you close it, or you can just close it where no more people come in you get these kids haircut, I say, and the barbershop needs to stay closed until this problem gets resolved. Right. And he said, but, and I said, there are no buts here. This is what has to happen. I said, because it is 1990, and this should not exist in 1990. And so he closed the barbershop, he took care of the problem, and I said, Please understand that the barbershop is not to reopen until this problem is resolved. And I get to my office on Monday morning, and I have a phone call from the wing commander's office. And it's his senior list advisor calling me, asking me what occurred. And I told him what occurred. And I said, I cannot believe that you're sitting here as a senior enlisted advisor for wing, and you've allowed this to take place at this base in 1990 for this long. And he said, well, Wing Commander is not happy. And I said, well, Chief Master Sergeant Wilson is not happy either. I said, and I don't think the Air Force would be happy either. I said, so it's your call, you know, as to how you guys fix it, but it really needs to be fixed. And so he says, but, and I said, there's no buts here. And not in this particular case. I said, it's 1990. It should not exist in 1990. And so, barbershop stayed closed for about a week until they got it resolved. <laughs> and I was not the most liked guy in England when I sure first got in that area. But <laughs> I had to do what I knew was right at that particular point in time. And, and it, it was just, for me, it was really frustrating, you know, to have served so long and to still see things like this occurring. Right. You, you know, and I, I, there were other things that were occurring on the base. I went in to make an appointment with, uh, we're going to get a records check for something. And I signed in on the records check roster. And before I could sit down and call my name, and there were young Aaron in there sitting waiting to get waited on. And I'm like, what about them? You know? Right. You know, they work the flight line. They're hustling aircrafts. They came in to get stuff done also. And the young sergeant said, Well, my boss said that, you know, if a chief or a colonel signs in, we got to take them, you know? And I said, It doesn't work like that, guys. Not, it's, no. Who's your boss? Tell me who your boss is. I'll talk to him, you know? And he said, well, We're just doing what your boss says. And so they sent a young captain out to me, and he told me, he said, well, I said, send me to the colonel. I said, but you can't do this to these kids. It's 1990. You can't treat them like second-class citizens. They're the ones to keep the flight line going. You know, I says, I can wait to get my records checked or to do my records review. I don't need to jump in front of them because I'm a chief master sergeant. That doesn't make me, you know, holier than thou. You know, so... There were still some things that I saw that needed to be changed. And, and so 
I, I probably spent the better part of the last four years of my military as a chief master sergeant chopping down some bridges that had still existed. That nice. I, I was just surprised that they existed. I was really surprised they existed. So it's 91 that you left London? I left there in 94. I was oh. there four years. Oh, okay. 90 to 94, okay. yes. So how, you, how did you feel about separating now? This has been 24 years. 27. 27 years. 26 years, 11 months, 16 days. All right, that's right. I was ready. <laughs> I was you ready, ready to go. I was ready to retire. Um, now, yeah. how old were you then? Uh, 90, 94. 94, I don't know. I got to do that. Ad, no, that's 40-something years old. That's 40. Okay. 40 something. Where I'm going is transitioning yeah. back into yeah. civilian life. Yeah. Yeah. Are we just going to retire, or are we going to, or have we started thinking about another career? Oh, we start thinking about another career by then. And what is that career? Well, you know, I, I know one thing that I didn't want to do is I didn't want anything to do with the federal government or the military <laughs> initially coming out the door because I had done that time with them. Mm -hmm. But I knew that it was time to go, and I asked. I asked one of my bosses, I said, how do you know when it's time to retire? And he said, you will know. He said, you will know when it's time to retire. And he was absolutely right. I woke up one morning, five o'clock in the morning I woke up, and I said, it's time to retire. Okay. And it was a year out before I was going to retire. Right. I called my father on the phone, and I said, Dad, I'm going to retire in a year. And he said to me, but you don't have 30 years in yet. And I said, Dad, I don't need 30 years. I said, the last pay raise I can get is at 26, 27 anyway. Right. So I'm done. You know? And he said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, next year I'm going to retire. And he said, okay. And a year from the date that I decided I was going to retire, I retired. So what did you do after the service? After the service, I moved back to the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Uh -huh. And again, I said, nothing to do with the federal government. I wanted nothing to do with the federal government. And lo and behold, I find a job and I'm working for Navy Federal Credit Union. And I'm like, do I really want to do this? Well, I walk in the door with all of this computer experience in my background, and they're trying to push me over into the computer, computer arena. And I said, folks, I said, please understand. I've done the computer thing. I said, I remember when there were big, huge computers, twice as big as the building, and now it's emails and, you know, stuff like that. Right. I saw it all change. Streamlined. Yeah. I said, I, I don't want to do that. I want a job where when I get up and walk off from the job, nobody calls me at home. Nobody's you know, <laughs> saying, oh, we need this, we need that. Uh -huh. That's the kind of job I want. So they gave me a job as a telephone loan counselor. And I worked as a telephone loan counselor at Navy Federal Credit Union in Vienna, Virginia. Okay. And lo and behold, snow snowstorm comes up in Virginia. Navy Federal was not prepared for the snowstorm. They never experienced anything like this before in their lives. And me, being ex-military, knows what it means to go into a fixed mode I went to work early that day and found out none of the supervisors were on duty because they couldn't get in because they were snow locked right. at home. Right. And so I kind of set up just what you would do in the military, recall roster and everything and figured out who was there working, told the kitchen folks that if you have to go home, go home, but somebody needs to stay and leave the kitchen open, all the food's free and everything. And I just directed traffic until we got from under the mist of the snowstorm. You know, and what was that time period? A week? Uh, yeah, it's about a week. About a week. About, about a week. You know, I, I left after about three or four days. You know, I, I, I didn't realize I was up 24 hours until somebody told me, you've been up 24 hours, you can't continue to do this, you got to get some sleep. Well, and I came ready because I brought three or four changes of clothes and everything because I just figured we were going to be there. Okay, so you got to that week, and I don't want to say your superiors, but the people. Yeah. What was the reaction at the end of, of you completing this mission? Well, I got a call from the president's office. It was told me when I came back to work, I didn't come from the president's office. And I went to his office, and he kicked everybody out of his office. He was having a meeting. He said, get out of here talking to this young man. And he says to me, when I get in his office, he says, I got to tell you this. He says, my finances is going crazy because they've never had anybody for 24 hours, and we don't know how to get your patients sorted out. He said, but I got to tell you that up front. He said, so we'll fix it eventually. 
he said, but he says, I don't know what to say. Yeah, he said, I don't know what to tell you or how to thank you for what you did. And I said, but I said, we advertised ourselves as 24 hours a day, seven days a week service. And I kind of felt that's what we had to do because we were serving the military folks out there. And he said, well, you're absolutely right. You know, and um, we saluted Spartan and I left his office and uh, it was not a month later. Uh, they hired the first two black male loan officers in the credit union. Okay. That was one of them. There you go. Yeah, it was that was you know that was unexpected, totally unexpected. But I worked for them for five years. And then was that the end of working? That no, that wasn't the end of working. That was just the beginning of working. What was the next thing? The next thing was I had a friend of mine that kept chasing me because he said, you know, look, you gotta go back, you got a security clearance. You can't just toss it out the window. And you have to, so you have to go back where? To the military? No, he said I took a GS job. And wound up working for Defense Information Systems Agency, okay? Uh -huh. And I was working for Defense Information Systems Agency when 9-11 happened. And uh, that for me just brought back memories of being in the military. And it really brought back memories because I had a team that was over at the Pentagon that day. And I would have been over at the Pentagon that day had I not agreed to switch uh, sites with the young lady that was working with me and she wanted to be nearer to her home because she didn't want to have to travel to California and I said I'll take California and I'll take Atlanta, wow. you take DC and she had responsibility for the team going to the Pentagon that day. Luckily, unbeknownst to any of us, she never late for anything. That day she was late because she had to stop at the bank to get a check and the team was a team of contractors she had working for her could not go over to the other side of the building without her escorting them. And so by the time she got there, the plane had already hit the Pentagon and she could not get in the building. And the team was on the other side and they were evacuated out of the building. So we lost some people in there. My, oh, yeah. my boss lost his wife. Mm -hmm. um, I lost a high school friend of mine. Right. Worked with his wife in, in the building and everything, but it was for me it was a rehash of the 20, 20, 40, 26 years I spent in the military. Is what it was. I saw it all over again. Right. So that was that was with me, you know, and um, you know the, that was when the airports got crazy again, and you had to have all kinds of documentation to get out of fly anywhere. We still had stuff that we had to do that was, you know, mission oriented, you know. Um, that's how I wound up here. Okay. <laughs> I have only one last question for yes. you, but this is your interview, obviously. Yeah. But my nephew was living in the Bronx the day of 9-11, woke up late for work, oh, wow. got stuck in the train. He's fine. Yeah. Because of 911, they shut everything down in New York City. Yeah. He woke up late, by the grace of God, mm -hmm. and was stuck in the train. Right. Coming coming from the Bronx, mm -hmm. going down to 911 where his job was. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here's the last question. Okay. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. Okay, I sure hope I didn't do too much. Is there any <laughs> I shouldn't ask this question. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered this in this interview? And also, as far as future leaders are concerned, as far as young people are concerned, as far as your, your family, you know, your children, your grandchildren, mm -hmm. what advice do you have going forward just as far as the future? And also about the political atmosphere, and this is a long question, mm -hmm. the political atmosphere and also, we're back and on the verge, hopefully not, with another war, conventional. Lives, military lives, will be at stake of being lost. What is your, what is your, um, what's your worldview on that? You know, my, my worldview on it, and, and, and it's, it's, it's changed a lot 
over the years. And, and the one thing that I am just truly, truly a believer that, you know, we as human beings have to refocus and realize that we're not the ultimate. Okay, we're, we're not the ultimate. The ultimate is upstairs. Okay. He is the one who calls the shots here. Okay, and we're placed here on this earth. Okay, to do his work for him and represent him and decision making you can't base it on politics you can't base it on money you, 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 you can't base it on if you're going to be liked or if you're not going to be liked you, you, you're going to have to weigh and decide every decision you make some of them are going to be tough decisions. Some of them are going to be decisions that are not pleasing to everybody. But you have to make sure that whatever you do for the rest of your lives, that you do it to the best of your ability and that the decisions that you make are truly, truly your decisions and that they're not influenced by dollars, that they're not influenced by positions, that are promised to you, that they're not influenced by, you know, things out there that don't matter. You know, it's, it's what you have to do, you know, when it comes to making good, smart decisions. Um, you know, the, the term family first is, is just always in my mind. You got to look at decisions that you make. And if you have a family, you have to look at the impact it's going to have on your family when you make a decision. Because they're first. They're going to be here when you're gone. You know, my kids are going to be here when I'm gone. My grandkids are going to be here when I'm gone. My right. grandkids, grandkids are going to be here when I'm gone. You know, and the decisions that I have made over the years, and the decisions that I have to continue to make, are going to impact them. Okay, it's going to impact them in the end, you know, is, 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 what, is what it's going to be, you know. Um, when you start talking politics, i got to tell you this about politics. Politics to a military person was not about Republican, Democrat. It was about who was the best president that was going to take care of the military at that particular point in time mm -hmm. is what it was all about, right? It was not about, oh, I can't vote for that guy because he's a Democrat, or I can't vote for him. No, it was about who was going to take care of us at that particular point in time we were in the military. It was just something that just, that was the way it was when I was in the military. I mean, and to this day, that's the way it has to be for people out there. I mean, you know, you can't get hung up on one. Okay, well, I'm, that was a perfect answer. God is the answer that we all answer to. Right. Um, I need to go ahead and and thank you for a wonderful interview, and also I need to thank you for your service to this country. You're welcome. You, you, I mean, this has been a pleasure to do this. Absolutely.